All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all. I'm Carlene Griffith Sekou, and um, I will be your facilitator of our conversation with Professor Keisha, Keisha Khan Perry. Um, is that Professor Keisha Khan Perry? Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> And uh, as we move through the, the rest of our, our program, um, we'll be talking about gentrification, uh, contested lives, um, gentrification, and the politics of, of, of displacement. Um, so I will go ahead and introduce Keisha Khan Perry now, then we'll watch a brief video. Professor Perry will uh, give a brief framing of our conversation and then we'll engage in dialogue in a conversation. Keisha Khan Perry received her BS in Spanish and Women's Studies from Georgetown University and her MA and PhD in Social Anthropology from the University of Texas at Austin. She is currently an Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Brown University, where she specializes in race, gender, and politics in the Americas, urban geography and questions of citizenship, intellectual history, and disciplinary formation, as well as the interrelationship between scholarship, pedagogy, and political engagement. She has conducted extensive research in Argentina, Belize, Brazil, Ecuador, Mexico, and the United States. Her first book, Black Women Against the Land Grab, The Fight for Racial Justice in Brazil, the fall of 2013, Minnesota Press, is an ethnographic study of black women's activism in Brazilian cities, specifically an examination of black women's participation and leadership in neighborhood associations in the reinterpretations of racial and gender identities in urban spaces. Winner of the National Women's Studies Association 2014, Gloria Anzaldúa, Book Award, this book includes an analysis of the relationship between environmental justice movements and land and housing rights struggles in Brazil. She is currently writing the book, Anthropology for Liberation, that draws heavily from her ethnographic research experience in Brazil with the emphasis on the complexity of doing activist research amid racial and gender violence. She is also working on two other book projects, The Historical Paradox of Citizenship, Black Land Ownership, and Loss in the Americas, and Evictions and Convictions, which represent a continuation of her ongoing research on black land, law, on black land loss and ownership in relationship to the material articulation of citizenship in Brazil, Jamaica, and the United States. Another ongoing research project is a multilingual and transnational exploration of black women's political work in Latin America. She examines how black women mobilize political movements across borders and how they understand themselves as agents in creating a diasporic community. She has won numerous awards over the years to support her research, such as the National Science Foundation and Fulbright Fellowships. There was no part of this that I could edit out. <laughs> we are indeed honored, and I might say that Professor Pear, uh, Keisha Khan Perry is someone that I look to as an emerging scholar, and she has been um, all that one would hope for as a mentor um, in this in this field. So please joining me with a warm join with me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Keisha Khan Perry. for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to show the video before I talk or after. I show the video now. Gentrification is constantly being talked about. In the past 10 years, the number of Google searches for the word gentrification has more than doubled, and mentions in the news and in literature have gone up. 
So people are talking about gentrification, but they often mean different things when they use the term. Gentrification is a process of neighborhood change that includes economic change in a historically disinvested neighborhood by means of real estate investment and new, higher income residents moving in, as well as demographic change, not only in terms of income level, but also in terms of changes in the education level or racial makeup of residents. Gentrification is complex and needs some explaining. To understand it, there are three key things to consider. The historic conditions, especially policies and practices that made communities susceptible to gentrification. The way that central city disinvestment and investment patterns are taking place today as a result of these conditions. And the ways that gentrification impacts communities. Over the last century, Many policies and practices have created racialized patterns of disinvestment in city centers that have left low-income communities of color particularly susceptible to gentrification. From the 1930s through the late 60s, standards set by the federal government and carried out by banks explicitly labeled neighborhoods home to predominantly people of color as risky and unfit for investment. This practice, now known as redlining, meant that people of color were denied access to loans that would enable them to buy or repair homes in their neighborhood. Other housing and transportation policies of the mid-20th century fueled the growth of mostly white suburbs and the exodus of capital from urban centers, in a phenomenon often referred to as white flight. Take the GI Bill as an example. The program guaranteed low-cost mortgage loans for returning World War II soldiers. But discrimination limited the extent to which black veterans were able to purchase homes in the growing suburbs. In fact, the Federal Housing Administration largely required that suburban developers agree to not sell houses to black people in order for the developers to access these guaranteed loans. Left behind in central city neighborhoods, low-income households and communities of color bore the brunt of highway system expansion and urban renewal programs, which resulted in the mass clearance of homes, businesses, and neighborhood institutions, and set the stage for widespread public and private disinvestment in the decades that followed. In more recent history, the foreclosure crisis also contributed to neighborhood-level vulnerability to gentrification. In low-income communities of color, disproportionate levels of subprime lending resulted in mass foreclosure, leaving those neighborhoods vulnerable to investors seeking to purchase and flip homes in bulk. Today, both people and capital are flooding back into these historically disinvested neighborhoods. One reason new people are moving into these neighborhoods is because of their relative affordability. In many U.S. cities, the rental market has gotten increasingly expensive, and even moderate income earners are on the hunt for lower housing costs. This means that in some places, they are looking in historically disinvested communities, often the same neighborhoods previous generations left behind during the days of white flight. These neighborhoods are often characterized by older historic housing stock that appeals to new residents and close proximity to city centers, where jobs, restaurants, and art spaces are increasingly locating. Cities are also investing in revitalizing some of these neighborhoods, for example, with improved transit access and infrastructure, in part to draw in newcomers. On the ground, gentrification may look like real estate speculation, with investors flipping properties for large profits, as well as high-end development, and landlords looking for higher-paying tenants, increased investment in neighborhood amenities like transit and parks, changes in land use, for example, from industrial land to restaurants and storefronts, and changes in the character of the neighborhood, as community-run businesses are replaced by businesses catering to new residents' needs. While increased investment in an area can be positive, gentrification is often associated with displacement, which means that, in some of these communities, longtime residents are not able to stay to benefit from new investments in housing, healthy food access, or transit infrastructure. Instead, lower-income families, often families of color, may find themselves facing rent increases, evictions, or other displacement pressures, and left with no other choice but to move to suburban or even exurban areas, far away from their jobs and the businesses and service providers they know. This can mean more time commuting, less time spent at home, and increased isolation, depression, and stress levels. For children, displacement can disrupt educational pathways and generate negative health impacts. Even for longtime residents who are able to stay in newly gentrifying areas, 
Changes in the makeup and character of a neighborhood can lead to a reduced sense of belonging or feeling out of place in one's own home. For example, Unique cultural vibrancy can be lost as places of worship see their congregants displaced to faraway cities and towns. In addition, family-run businesses and nonprofit organizations may be forced out as their customer base disperses or as their commercial rents rise past what they can sustain, affecting the ability of those who stay to access the goods and services they need. There might also be changes in neighborhood norms and policing, for example, an increased police presence in order for new residents to feel safe. On the whole, we cannot ignore that the adverse impacts of gentrification, ranging from individual health effects to the suburbanization of poverty, are only the most recent wave in a pattern of urban restructuring that has been imposed upon and negatively affected low-income and communities of color over generations. Public, private, and nonprofit sector leaders have the opportunity to implement strategies that give longtime residents a chance to benefit from increased investment in their communities and even be part of driving how some of the changes in their neighborhoods take place. In order to invest in communities without displacement, policies, programs, and financing tools are needed to protect renters from formal and informal displacement pressures, facilitate the production of more affordable housing, and preserve and upgrade the existing affordable housing stock. Involving community residents in planning and decision-making about their neighborhoods and region can and should be a key piece of all three of these strategies. Taken together, these strategies can help keep communities together so that everyone can enjoy access to improved schools, better food options, more job opportunities, and safer neighborhoods. Qualities we know make cities and regions healthy and vibrant. We're ready for you. How's the view for you now? Is this better? Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. She was a very lovely young woman, but it was just one person that I've seen. <laughs> so thank you. No problem. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to participate in this conference and for being so accommodating, and especially you, Carlene um, Rafitzik, and thank you so much for um, the wonderful introduction and, um, of course, for including me um, as part of this conversation. I'm hoping that this will be a conversation primarily because I firmly believe that questions around not just displacement, but around housing justice and land redistribution will be important questions of our day. In the same way that we've been thinking a lot about affordable health care, I think we're going to have to start to prioritize and think more deeply and carefully about what housing justice looks like for the upcoming decades and what a true democracy uh, in the United States, for example, will look like with housing justice on the table, right? So I think I really hope that it's more of a dialogue um, as we move forward. I also wanted to um, begin with just um, reading just a brief excerpt from my book, um, Black Women Against Landcraft, The Fight for Racial Justice um, in Brazil, and there's a section that I wrote entitled, If We Didn't Have Water, Spirituality, Land, and Environmental Justice, right? Um, and I wanted to begin by saying it says, to begin to comprehend this inseparable connection between black women's religious culture and politics, the words of the late Brazilian literary scholar of Bahia coach George Amado in his novel, Sea of Death, from Time. The quote, the ocean is large, the sea is a road without end. Waters make up more than half of the world. They are three quarters of it, and all of that belongs to Iam unquote. In the African diaspora religion of Candomblé, practiced by the vast majority of Baliens, Iam is the highly referred goddess of the sea, primarily uh, commonly known as Amai Gazabo, so the mothers of the waters. The mother of the waters. Each year in Salvador, February 2nd marks the most important days of celebration and the Festa de Ipanja, which takes place in the Rio Vermelho coastal neighborhood. With more resources today, particularly government sponsorship, 
The festival has been transformed from community practice into a massive cultural project of interest for both locals and national and international tourists. The, not, the dominant ceremonial presence of black fishermen and Candomblé religious leaders, most of whom are women, reminds us, however, that although Hugo Vermeulen is now predominantly white elite neighborhood, black fishing colonies have historically um, have historically occupied coastal lands of Salvador and have carried out these traditions since the slavery period. So the neighborhood that I focus on in my own work, Gamboa Baixo, is now one of a few coastal um, black urban fishing colonies that exist on the Bahian coast. And two Iamanja festivals still occur simultaneously. The large one in the Rio Verde neighborhood and a smaller one in their neighborhood. Like in most fishing communities, local residents pay homage to the goddess of the sea for protecting the fishermen and fishermen while they work and for supplying the sea with sufficient fish, an important natural, um, natural resource that sustains the local economy and African inspired culinary tradition. More important, Gamboa de Baixa residents express their gratitude for French Manja for protecting their children while they play on the neighborhood beaches. And partly what I talk about a lot in this book, and I actually had no intentions to talk about um, Afro-Brazilian religion. In fact, I avoided it primarily because in Salvador, the expectation of an anthropologist is that you're either doing research on, on religion or on the way, or we're doing research on, let's say, cultural practice like a quick. Right? So I tried to avoid it, and I found that it was impossible to not talk about uh, Afro-Brazilian uh, religion deeply inspired uh, the movements to fight against evictions um, during moments of urban development that, that, um, for, that created what they call a wave of clearance um, of um, family black neighborhoods as they were mo uh, modernizing um, in um, cities like Salvador. Right? So that's what I, I was actually, in essence, forced to take into consideration um, not just how inspiring the religion was in terms of the kind of strength that it gave them, but how necessary access like um, to resources such as the sea was for the sustenance of, of their of their um, communities and livelihood. So I think it's important that oftentimes when we think about um, the structural forces of um, gentrification um, that is um, certainly fueled by a long history of colonialism, um, and colonization of cities, but also certain some of the, 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 the underlying questions of racial capitalism that underline these decisions um, um, that even inform books like this one. If you haven't read um, N.D. Um, Colony's book on um, a world more concrete, real estate, and making of Jim Crow, um, Jim Crow South Florida, um, what the, the essence is that oftentimes in these contexts, the human beings that are profoundly impacted by these processes get lost. And the cultural practices, the community practices, the ways of being, um, I think, oftentimes get lost. And there's a way that the abstract um, oftentimes take over. So gentrification is not just a displacement and the loss, there are actual people that are being mobilized um, and, and lost in the process. So I would say that over the past, um, uh, 50 years, a lot of my work has been framed around these primary questions that I hope that we can um, discuss today, right? Um, so one is um, how we understand the key question of black disposition, specifically the loss of land, territorial rights, mass evictions and housing demolitions and forced displacement as a form of anti-black right? So while I document some of the, um, the symbolic and cultural practices that profoundly impacted, I want us to think about what happens when we think about questions like gentrification, um, people being pushed out of, of, of uh, modernizing neighborhoods, um, what it means as a form of anti-black government. Also, part of the, the, our, the key kind of argument of all of my work has always been that you can't think about black disposition without how police violence and racial terror rate uh, works in tandem with the destruction of black uh, environments. So, in essence, mass um, uh, racial terror um, in terms of state violence and mass incarceration and, and, and so forth 
work in tandem with mass evictions, the destruction of black urban neighborhoods, and gentrification, right? So I want you to think about one of the first things that you see, which is not really mentioned in this neighborhood, is the first thing that appears in a gentrifying neighborhood is increased police presence, right? So partly, you know, the neighborhood has to be safe for the new colonizers that, you know, they have to... So I'm sure you've seen this in Boston, for example, where neighborhoods that are in so-called transition immediately have an increased police presence. And what you see is that that self-imprisonment increases, for example. So in my recent work on evictions and convictions, I documented and looked at and analyzed how in these neighborhoods that were changing, the numbers of self-imprisonment increased tremendously. Another factor is that even in looking even internationally, when I was doing my research in Brazil, I had no intention of doing research on police abuse, right, or police terror. But people saw that as always being part of the process of trying to eradicate and eliminate this cultural neighborhood. Increased police presence, saying that folks are criminal, justifying presence by saying, you know, everyone, you know, a bunch of black folks, criminal, prostitutes, and so forth, and just everyday terrorizing of the neighborhood that would justify the so-called slum clearance, right? Also, a key kind of argument and point that I want to make, but I hope we can talk a little bit more about what this means, is how these predominantly black urban spaces should be understood as always racialized, gendered terrains of domination, in which black women's politics are deeply connected to resistance against geographic domination as practice of forced removal and dispossession. And let me unpack that and say that some of my work has really looked closely in terms of documenting the everyday experiences of black women, specifically in urban spaces. So if you look at, oftentimes, how black women experience state violence is often lost. So people feed it, a lot of the discourse about police violence and police death and killing focuses primarily on black men dying in a pool of blood or doing police confrontations, right? Part of what I'm arguing is that if you look at, for example, instances when black women, maybe the police has called on them at the welfare office in the recent cases that we've seen, or even black women is grilling on the sidewalk or at a pool party, that they're constantly these, or the music is too loud, they're constantly these constant conflicts and moments of confrontation and just violence. So these spaces become really key spaces of trying to kind of make state a claim and ownership and domination over these spaces, right? So if you look at some cities, they'll say, you know, there's a lot of nuisance laws where, or the reinforcement of nuisance laws where the police is being called on black women and even just poor people more broadly, right? So I think I want you to think about that these spaces are just, are always racialized and gendered and profoundly impacted how the racialized and the gendered poor experience these spaces. I think, I can't remember the name of this woman, but she recently, for example, died while trying to go down a flight of stairs in New York, right, in the city subway. And I think about how much money is spent on policing in the city of New York for people who are jumping the turnstile, but little has been spent in the infrastructure that would have avoided her killing. So if you're waiting for black women to be shot by the police, you're not going to see these other spaces of black women that are experiencing the deadly impact of poor infrastructure, of increased police spending, et cetera. So I just want us to keep that in mind. Also, that this kind of dispossession of housing, land, et cetera, foreclosure, if you think about police processes, that this has also been at the center of activism throughout the Americas. So from North America to all the way to Brazil is part of my own work, is that there's been a lot of focus on what Shrine would call the black land heist that informs kind of the, that all of the discussions around the fight back like slavery and colonialism. And I say this because if you, a lot of the early academic scholars, black community scholars, they focus primarily on public education, housing, et cetera. And a lot of my work is 
we've been trying to kind of get us back to our feminist groups to look at some of the material dimensions of, um, of not just anti-black racism, but also the kinds of activism that have emerged as a result, right? So I think if you really are trying to understand social black social movement throughout America, I would say housing is at the center, the fight against dispossession and displacement is at the center um, of those um, um, social movements. I would also kind of um, add, and I think that's something I'd like us to talk about today, which is that um, oftentimes well, um, these activists go and look, ignore, but black women are key political and tag, um, protagonists mobilizing at the grassroots um, against forced removals and for police abolition, for example, for better infrastructural um, resources, uh, bus, um, bus, uh, bus and other forms of transportation development, that they're at the forefront of these conversations. And always, I would say, often critiques of gender racial capitalism that a lot of us um, are oftentimes not paying attention to. So I think that um, a lot of my work has been trying to give attention to those kinds of activists. So the woman in the neighborhood that in, in the city of Salvador Bahia that is concerned about her access to the beach in order to practice religion, but that woman also has all children and she's concerned about how they get to school, how she gets to work early in the morning, uh, and, and, and even in cities like the Jewish Bonero, where um, one of the first things that happens is that they'll change the, uh, to really promote um, racial discrimination, is that they'll, tra they'll change the transportation system to make it even more difficult um, for uh, poor black people to access the more privileged and kind of coveted parts of the city. Um, for those of you, and I'll, uh, I won't take too much time to have a real conversation, but for those of you who are um, knowledgeable of, for example, the assassination of Marie Franco, one of, um, she was shot and killed um, last year, one of the main um, parts of her political agenda was really about um, improving neighborhood infrastructure, but also improving, for example, the public transportation that made it, uh, that she felt and maybe argued for discriminatory in terms of how um, it made inaccessible certain parts of the city. So one of the things that's most noticeable, um, for example, in the development of um, infrastructure for the Olympic Games or the World Cup is how they basically made it more difficult for poor black uh, commuters to reach uh, the areas uh, where tourism for tourists would be frequented. So partly what I'm suggesting here is that we we think critically about how all of these processes are interconnected and also the kind of activism that comes out of these experiences at the grassroots and the uh, the formal um, level. And I would just like to kind of open it up for kind of a more of a conversation by also saying that a uh, significant part of my work is not just focusing on the displacement and the violence that takes place, but also the kinds of proposals for urban de de uh, redevelopment that are more inclusive that comes out of neighborhoods in terms of socialized housing, in terms of collective land rights, um, and other kinds of projects that promotes um, in, in the tradition of black activism in this, in this country and throughout the diaspora that promotes communalism, that promotes um, uh, a, much, uh, a much more uh, inclusive form of uh, engagement in urban spaces and beyond. So I'll just let you there and just to open it up for, for conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Perry. Um, and I just wanted to also put that in conversation with some of the particular um, discourses that are raised typically when we're talking about gentr when we're talking about um, the changing contours of, of, of um, urban neighborhoods or displacement of people, right? Who is displaceable? What bodies? What lives are are rendered disposable or rendered uh, display dis 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 displaceable? Um, and the argument often is that gentrification is good. It's actually community reinvestment, 
community redevelopment. Um, and that with these neighborhoods, with, with the revitalization of these neighborhoods come an infusion of capital. You have an infusion and influx of businesses and, and entrepreneurship. And who is included in that and who is left out, right? And with that, the, the cultural erasure and erosion, I know um, perhaps six months or so ago, if that, early last fall, there was an incident in Brooklyn, um, in a particular segment of Brooklyn, where a black man was, um, who had mental illness. Um, someone called the police on that black man. And this story happens in terms of the policing or over-policing that Professor Perry has mentioned with gentrification um, or said revitalization comes this, this policing. Um, and the incident in Brooklyn is that the police was called by a new neighbor, someone new to the neighborhood, um, and this gentleman ended up being killed. Um, I just thought of it, I just thought of this, but the neighbors and those who have been longstanding community members know this man. They know that he has mental illness. They never call the police on him. He is a part of the community. And so there's an understanding, but when you have others who are coming in who are not a part of the cultural communal fabric and who subscribe to a different set of values um, and who don't take time to understand and learn and be in relationship to the community um, in such a way that, that those who have been there are honored. Then you have this antagonistic, violent, um, uh, co colonialist relationship with the communities. I mean, in addition to pushing folk out because of the economic um, inaccessibility uh, to, to housing in particular, um, those are, you know, we are all familiar, many of us anyway, with pool party, uh, pool party patty, you know, people who call the police on black people in the United States, around the country, or barbecue Becky, and all of these incidences where black bodies are not supposed to be in certain places and are therefore criminalized um, and displaced through cr the, the criminal justice system as it were. So this is all a part of the textured conversation, um, among other things, and in, 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 in local context. Boston is perhaps the fourth, fourth fastest, um, was the last report that I heard, mo fastest gentrifying city in the mm -hmm. country with the typical um, studio in Boston now averaging about $2,000. Right. Um, this week alone, two elderly women in Mattapan um, are being kicked out by their landlord because he wants to raise the rent. And they've occupied and lived in that community for years, and they have nowhere to go. They're on Social Security. Um, and these are the kinds of day-to-day -day narratives and stories that are happening in conversation. Um, with this, there's a lot to cover. We can talk about the border and immigration and whose lives are contested and, and whose lives are displaced. But um, let's get to a, a dialogue. And if we have, do we have any questions um, for Professor Perry or comments on the subject? Yes. Yeah, I was um, sort of just thinking, you know, in terms of what what possible, um, you know, sort of solutions to begin to deal with this question of gentrification. So many, you know, many years ago, um, the, the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act, was something that was, you know, sort of pretty popular. And this was a little before, you know, particularly in Boston, you know, when you had the crash and, and so forth and, and everything. But is there any like legal strategies um, to look at how to uh, deal with the city, the state, and the federal government, uh, in, or even the banks, in that fact, um, for them not really uh, investing in communities in a way of, of giving loans to community uh, people, um, but then giving loans to others who had you know capital and so forth? Because the, the real question becomes, what what is what is equity? You know, what is value? 
and how they judge those things. And particularly if someone's been in a community for 30 years, they've created value in that community. If someone's going to come and benefit from it. So is there any legal strategies to begin to hit the various institutions with the city government, state government, that also, you know, sign up on these federal government, as well as the banks, to, to figure out how to really address this? Because it's a very, very serious uh, uh, issue nationally. You know, right. that we, we, in fact, you know, uh, I'm teaching at UMass. We got professors who can't even live here. Forget about students living in the community more. Yeah. You know, you, we, they recruit professors, they like, where they going? They live out way outside of, of the city because of the high cost of this. And so you got to make like $75,000 to rent an apartment in Boston now. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, that's a um, that's a really important question, and I probably won't be able to get into some of the nitty gritty about legal strategies. Even though I think a lot of um, I would say the best folks to talk about that are the grassroots organizations um, that are probably part of a much larger national network, such as the Right to the City, that have been mobilized and, and trying to do. Also, if if we learn anything from the recent Amazon. Um, problem in New York, that social movements actually work and activism actually works, right? And um, they learn from um, activists, for example, and others who have, who have knowledge around how Google destroyed uh, communities, how um, Amazon had been previously destroyed other communities elsewhere. If, if you look at the home crisis in places like Oakland and Seattle, you'll see precisely how the big boom and the, the invasion of these big corporations have decimated public school systems as well as any sort of affordable housing that had previously existed, right? So I think the important lesson there is not just how to mobilize the law off, but the law oftentimes we understand working favor with capital, um, but how activism actually does have an impact, right? So I think that's the, the, the one of the important things there. I think there's also um, another point that came up that um, Carlene mentioned, and as well as um, you just mentioned, there's something to be said about um, who's considered um, not just displaceable, but also disposable. And I want to draw upon Franz Fanon's idea of zones of non-being. There's a collective sense that these communities are already zones of non-being even before development takes place. Right? So the essence that when you start to think about where to run the new highway, where to build a new Whole Foods, wherever, who's going to get left, not, who's going to get either eradicated or permanently eliminated, who's going to be um, killed as a result of the increased police actions, um, is that black lives hold little value in the society, and I would say globally, which is the connection that I'm making to South America. So I think those are kind of key fundamental issues that we need to think about. That even before the police encounter, before the thought about where we're going to build this or where we're going to do this, is, is how people understand the meaning of black life, right? And I would say that black life holds little value in relationship to capital. And so I think that's something to think um, a lot about. Also, um, I think that the irony that you pointed out is that Black culture, Latino culture, they're all part of what a lot of people are seeking when they go to these spaces. When they get to these spaces, the very black culture comes a new right? So the ice cream is a problem, um, the loud black woman is a problem, but it's in the type of problem, you have one particular community to get access to this kind of culture. The hip hop that you love is too loud, you know, that you previously consumed. The suburbs is now too hot for you. Um, so I think there's a way that there's this irony of how culture operates in these moments. Um, and in the case of Brazil, um, Brazil understands itself as being primarily um, in terms of actual Brazilian culture is at the is at the center of Brazilian culture, but the actual black people reproduce so-called that 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 kind of national culture. Um, can't be in these new modernizing spaces that become a key part of how Brazil understands itself as a modern nation. And I would say the same thing happens here. What is what is American culture? What is American culture? But the very people who produce that culture are not permitted in these new coveted modernizing spaces, mm -hmm. right? 
So the, the very the very black culture that produces the hip hop that we we hear everywhere, right? Um, that predominantly white are seeking, um, you can't have them live next door. Mm-hmm. So I think those are uh, the most that I think uh, that I point uh, that you pointed out. And then another part of it that I think that um, NDP commonly points out in this book is that there's always some level of negotiation on the part of black people, right? Mm-hmm. So when I say so, basically that's the, the trouble of how hegemony works is that there are always some black people in the, in the community that oftentimes consume this discourse around development, around an, um, advancement, and, um, around that gentrification is good, that um, we're actually going to do better off, um, and also and then negotiate on the part of the community to their detriment. Right? So I think those are, the, those are something to kind of keep in mind as well. Yeah. And also, just to give you concrete resources, City Life, either Urbana does that work, Dorchester Not For Sale, in other parts of the U.S. by the block, where you have some really radical grassroots folk who are, who are organizing. I think of cases, um, this is happening, of course, in the, in, in, in the United States and, and abroad, and of course, the Brazilian context, but I was in London, and... Um, working with a, a black a BLM in London, but a group called Sisters Uncut, a, a radical feminist group, in uh, that, does that their sole design was to disrupt this process of social housing um, that was being sold 60% to private corporations. And the laws there are different, but they literally were occupying buildings and mm-hmm. and preventing and disrupting displacement of families. Year-round, activists uh, coordinated um, to occupy buildings in the refusal. And the same thing mm-hmm. is happening in Italy against um, the fascist mm-hmm. government of Salvini. Antifa groups are, are playing um, a running flank uh, rather to shield refugees who are coming through, who have no housing, who have no place to go, and other lower income populations who are being displaced. And mm-hmm. those contexts, you're able to, to take over buildings and the laws are such that it is not an easy process to displace people. Right In Italy, it's actually against the law to displace uh, people from housing. So it takes years and years and years and years. And so there is a a dimension of policy um, in addition to law in the United States that I think we must address here. Um, Yeah, so yes, Esmira. Thank you for your question. I think part of what I'm suggesting here 
is in the, I'm looking at, so I've written about this in relationship to Brazil, but I would make that same argument in the United States. And the argument that um, black people um, only serve a particular kind of purpose, right? So I think, for example, you cannot sustain, there is no tourism, um, there, is no, there is no nation without black people in, in the Brazilian context, for example, right? So part of Keelan Paul's argument is that, even, and at all levels, black people are involved in the Brazilian nation, but also in the, in the sustained um, day life, right? So this morning, um, for example, on WhatsApp, talking to one of my friends, um, who's an activist, and I said, oh, are you gonna be taking care of, are you gonna be doing carnival? What are you gonna be doing? And she says, well, I, you know, I'm working. And I said, really, you're in problems with, of course. And she said, well, I tried to take Saturday off, but the, you know, the, um, the woman who owns the house won't get Saturday off. She has a six-bedroom, uh, a five-bedroom, six-bath house, dog and cat. And the reality is that in order for her to go enjoy all of the carnival and all of the music that black folks are, play, uh, are, are playing and, and, and are producing, it also means that there's a black woman who then has to maintain their house to allow that to happen, right? But also, the, the very neighborhoods, and I think this is where transportation starts to play, is that those neighborhoods historically were always close to wealthy neighborhoods. So black women used to, and domestic workers, and all kinds of workers would live in proximity to these wealthy families where they would go and work, but now they're saying, well, you don't have to live so close anymore. Um, especially on these lands that are considered to be kind of coveted, coastal, part of the newer kind of global discourse around what is considered beautiful, beachfront. Um, historically, in, in a lot of these countries, beaches were where black people occupied. Um, they were considered the poorer, more undervalued lands, right? So I think there's a there's a sense that you you're, you only are valuable insofar as your labor as domestic workers your labor as cultural workers, but certainly not your not your value as people. And what's happening now is a lot of folks have theorized is that there's now a surplus labor, mm -hmm. right? Because of machines, uh, washing machines, and all other kinds of machines that you can, you can black bodies are increasingly disposable. And I would say that across the Americas, because their labor is basically for necessary. So whereas the past, and this is what NDP policy argues, in the past, People would actually go to great lengths and make sure that black folks were not incarcerated. Nowadays, the surplus labor is is being pushed out off time through mass incarceration and other form, as well as blatant discrimination and killing and death. Right, so black lives actually equal value in terms of labor. So I would say this is one of the, the contradictions of what it means to be uh, a nation that understands itself to be kind of actual Brazilian in culture, but since insofar as they, they produce that culture or produce a particular kind of labor when labor is no longer necessary, especially as they consume even more kind of pure culture or so forth, if, um, their bodies are disposable and certainly their neighborhoods are disposable. Thank you. Um, I think the second question, I'm sorry, I mean, the demolition. Um, demolition, as um, folks like my biggest have documented, are common practices uh, throughout the earth. Um, how many of you probably remember growing up with housing projects and seeing high rises? Or New Jersey, which is where I grew up, actually you could see the landscape was, was um, a lot of housing, um, a lot of high rises. If you're driving through New York and you go to particular areas where social housing, um, you know, were um, increasingly kind of being demolished, that was part of their strategy always. So I think that demolition, in terms of uh, rebuilding and clearing, basically what they call slum clearance, oftentimes funded by major institutions like the World Bank. Demolition was a, was a significant part of that. You would just clear the land and put and, and, and clear the land, and the people would be displaced, and and the, and the history and everything else would go with it. Right. So I think um, I think if you want to read more on just the practice and logic of demolition, I would say Mike Davis is probably one of the best persons uh, for that. Great, thank you. Do we have, we have time for perhaps one more question before we And, I, and I just to add one quick thing on Carlene is that sure. in the front, in the beginning of my book, I start off with the neighborhood Palestina, 
Mm -hmm. And the name of the neighborhood is um, basically named, inspired by Palestine. And I tell the story of how Donatelma is standing in front of a bulldozer in the neighborhood of Palestina, um, Palestine, in Salvador, um, trying to avoid the bulldozer from, from coming down onto her house, right? And there are several communities throughout Latin America that are named Palestina, are named um, based on um, communities in Palestine. And I would argue that it's out of solidarity with Palestinian struggle. It's a great connection. Thank you for that. Um, do we have one more question? If not, um, we will wrap up. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm white, and I am was in one of these neighborhoods. Like I brought too far from where this gentleman was killed by the police in Crown Heights. I believe that was. I actually lived in Flatbush. Um, before I came to HDS, and so I'm sort of wondering, um, you know, how, not necessarily like, I mean, maybe like a 101 of people sort of like get wrapped into, you come into one of these neighborhoods. I know even now I'm here at HDS, I'm not too far from Central Square, which was, they used to call it Central Square, and, or Central Scare, and so there's this idea that before I even came into, to come to HDS here as a student, um, I didn't know what I was getting into. Like I didn't know that I was sort of in some ways contributing to this process. And so I'm wondering how as a white person to be like a better ally, to be, to, like, what are some like basic things that we can do like once we're wrapped up in this, once we come into a neighborhood, see these things going on, <coughs> what to do, you know, what to do about it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's always a, a tough question. Um, I teach at um, a institution uh, in my courses in urban politics um, for many years before Mike Brown was shot and killed. Um, I would say that I attracted mostly white students and they were asking very similar questions as I, as I taught issues. I would say that the best people to learn from um, in terms of the kind of really important they're doing are the white activists. Um, that have been in the work, that have, um, you know, men and women of conscience who have, are working very hard um, around um, not just questions around kind of racial violence, but just generally around kind of housing justice and so forth. And I think what, what folks oftentimes fail to recognize and understand is that social housing and it's just like uh, social health care, socialized health care. Um, like public education, um, really benefits all of us. Capitalism, um, um, racial capitalism, um, and the way that it has developed in places like the United States, really has worked to the detriment of, four, of all people. The reason why, for example, you can't afford um, good quality housing for less, and you're not using a significant portion of your income, is because, I mean, it, it, it's precisely at the heart of, of how this impacts um, um, you know, how it impacts the lives. So if you look at, you know, the homeless population in the streets of Seattle, if you look at the homeless populations in, in, in Los Angeles, it has profoundly impacted whites as well. So I think when people start to really understand how the struggles are interconnected, and it's not just, you know, I think the, I think one can begin to think about how you can participate, not just in, um, um, not necessarily in terms of gentrifying neighborhoods, but in terms of anti-addiction struggles and so forth. I think the, the key thing, if you look at the anti-addiction mapping project that operates out of um, out of Oakland and New York, I mean those are those are projects that are majority led, um, led by by whites who have um, kind of in solidarity with communities of color. Um, I mean I think there are you know like I said I hope I hate to oversimplify it, but there are white people out there doing good political work that you can learn from um, that oftentimes the, I would say not heard, but they certainly, um, you know, there are people out there doing the work. And I would say that, you know, they're being leading, you know, some of the grassroots organizations that we mentioned, but um, that they, they see themselves as profoundly connected. Because I think the moment when you start to think about, well, I'm, you know, if, if you start, if I should rephrase this and say that um, um, there's a way that one of my colleagues 
calls it kind of half connected humans that a lot of us are half connected is that the reason why we start to re- like perpetuate is because we don't see ourselves as being profoundly connected mm-hmm. in very important ways. So I think that, um, yeah, I would say that there, there are just very good conscientious white folks out there doing the work um, that you can learn from in terms of these organizations that exist, people are out there in the eyes of line, mobilizing, they're using their technical skills for the advancement of social movements, um, yeah. Thank I you. hope that helps. No, yeah. totally, totally. And thank you for the anti... Um... Thank, you, thank you, But there, there's students in feminist studies at um, her name is Karen, I can't remember her last name, um, and feminist studies at UC Santa Cruz. She's one of the folks who founded the anti-eviction mapping project out of uh, Oakland, um, primarily because the housing justice movement is a movement for all people. I mean, it's just, I mean you see the impact of what happened to, you know, how Seattle was decimated. Um, I think I think if you if you start to see how we how um, you know how this is impacting all of us, I think you would see uh, how gentrification doesn't benefit not just for black folks but uh, you know, for brown folks. Uh, how we shouldn't as a people spend in such a significant portion of our income on housing mm-hmm. in the same way that we're also not um, we don't have access to good public education and good public health care. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for your questions, uh, Professor Keisha Khan Perry. Thank you so much for. Uh, thank you. I want to say thank work. you again for all of you. I know it's always awkward with Skype and um, the sound and the movement and so forth. Um, and if it looks weird, it's also because I'm standing up. I have to say so. Um, but I thank you so much for your questions. And if any of you have any, um, if you want to follow up with any questions via email, please feel free to do so. And um, there are a lot of kind of names of organizations that escape me, but um, if you send me an email, I'll try to send you the information. And so thank you so much for your questions and, and your attention. Great, thank you.